Thanks. Well, yeah, thank you, Felipe, and welcome back, everyone. Where it's, it's great to see so many people here again, excited about <laughs> tropical geometry. I'm going to continue my introduction to tropical geometry, and um, so this will be a. And the, the idea again is to make this a open and inclusive of things. So you should. That means you should only. Um, yeah, so please do ask questions in the chat and hopefully this is meant to be accessible to a broad range of people. So let me, so let me start by reviewing the lecture from last time. So the slogan of the lecture last time, you'll remember, is tropical geometry is a combinatorial shadow of algebraic geometry. So we saw last time we focused more on the shadow part. That was the fact that the variety is a sorry that the tropical variety is the image under the valuation of, of an actual variety, and I'll remind you about that on the next slide. It, and then today we're going to focus more on the combinatorial part. So we're going to see that the shadow has a lot of combinatorial structure. So let, let's go with that. We'll, we'll start with the, the. So we want to start by. The, I guess, recalling in what we did. So the idea is, the other slogan we had was that tropical geometry is algebraic geometry over the tropical semi-ring. So the tropical semi-ring is R union infinity with two operations, tropical plus, which is minimum, and tropical addition, which is, sorry, tropical multiplication, which is addition. And then the idea is that if we have a usual polynomial, and we want to turn it into a tropical polynomial, we turn multiplication into addition, addition into minimum, and we take the valuation of coefficients. So formally, this means we're going to start with a polynomial f being the sum of a u x to the u, whereas last time we're using multi-index notation here. So this is x1 to the u1 times x2 to the u2 up to xn to the un. And this is a polynomial in k adjoin x1 up to xn, where k is a valued field. And then to tropicalize, we just turn multiplication into addition, addition into minimum, and take valuations. So the tropicalization is the tropical sum of the valuation of AU tropical times x to the u. And last time we discussed in usual arithmetic, this is the minimum of the valuation of AU plus x dot u. And that's because in usual arithmetic, x to the u meaning x1 to the u1 up to times x2 to the u2 up to xn to the un is, is x dot u. Okay, so we have this way of going from usual polynomials to tropical polynomials. And then we also saw if we had a tropical polynomial, so if we had g in r bar, in, in the semi-rig of tropical polynomials, so that's r bar join x1 up to xn, so that means it's a polynomial with coefficients of the tropical semi-rig and every operation is tropical. So multiplication is addition, addition is minimum. And then the hypersurface of G is the, going to be the, the locus W and R bar to the N, where either G of W is infinity or the minimum of G of W is achieved at least twice. So we saw last time the tropical polynomial X plus y plus zero, so where those are tropical pluses. In usual arithmetic, that's the minimum of x, y, and zero. And we saw here that we'd get a picture like this. So you, on this range, the positive y-axis, the minimum is achieved at both x and zero, so it's achieved at least twice. On the positive x-axis, the minimum is achieved at both zero and y, so it's achieved at least twice. And on this what, negative y equals x, the minimum is achieved in both x and y, so it's achieved at least twice. Okay, so that's a hypersurface of a tropical polynomial. Now, if we start with an affine variety, so that means it's going to be the common zeros, the common solutions to a bunch of polynomials in some ideal. So this will be an ideal in the polynomial ring in n variables over k then trop x is going to be the intersection over all polynomials of the, in the ideal 
of the, the tropical hypersurface defined by trop F. So for every polynomial in this ideal, that's a polynomial, a usual polynomial, but we can tropicalize it to get a tropical polynomial, take the tropical hypersurface in, in this sense above, and take the intersection of all of them. An intersection because it's the common solutions. So this is tropicalizing a variety by tropicalizing the equations. Okay. But then we could also you know, tropicalize a variety by tropicalizing you know, the, the actual points. And that was the punchline last time, was the fundamental theorem, which said that the you know, that this definition also equals the closure of the valuation of x. So that means take your points in x, apply valuation coordinate wise, so you get a point in r bar to the n, do that for every point in the variety, and then take the closure. So the fundamental theorem of tropical geometry says tropicalizing the equations gives you the same answer as tropicalizing the points. Okay, so that's the shadow. Okay, and I see we ha already have a few questions. And so from the point, from the question about, we know in classical algebraic geometry, the variety of an ideal is the same as the variety of the radical by Nurshtal and Zatz. And yes, these two will define the same tropicalization. So from what I've told you so far, we're only seeing this underlying set. And I'll say maybe a few words later in the, the talk about when we might see a difference. And should F range of the tropical ideal, right, okay. So maybe this is a question about last time I gave you a slightly different definition. I said, let's take the tropical, let's tropicalize the ideal and then take the intersection of the hypersurfaces for every epo tropical polynomial G in the tropical ideal. It turns out that's the same as this definition. So I'm I was just taking the shortcut here of sort of combining two steps for a shorter statement. So this is the, so this is, you are correct that this is not quite the definition I gave yes on Monday, but it is, it is the same. So maybe that's a, a bonus exercise. Okay, that's what we did last time. What are we doing today? Goal of today is the structure theorem. So that's the idea that tropical varieties have a lot of combinatorial structure. So let me state it, let me read it for you, but then most of the talk is actually going to be explaining the words in this theorem. So we're going to have an irreducible subvariety of affine space, a to the n. And then the claim is that trop x is the support of a pure R rational balanced polyhedral complex of dimension, the same dimension as x, that is connected through co-dimension one. Okay. You're not expected to know these, what all of these things mean yet, but I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk explaining them. But I'll just maybe wave my hands a little bit at the, um, th with the picture here. The idea here is, as we described last time, we might start with an elliptic curve. If it's described by an appropriate, an equation of the right form in, in, in the plane, we'll get, when we tropicalize, we'll get a picture like this. And you can see that we started with a curve and we've got a one dimensional object in the end. So we've got, I mean, so that's the fact that we're keeping the dimension. And then we're going to, and I'll, we'll say more about, about this as we go on. Maybe before I do move on though, let's say a word about attrib attribution. One of the strange things about this theorem is that most of it predates tropical geometry by almost 20 years. And this is something that happens surprisingly often in, in tropical geometry. This is not the only time this has happened. So it turns out that Berry and Groves, who are geometric group theorists, needed to think about the image of an affine variety under evaluation map in the 80s, which is also almost 20 years before tropical geometry existed as a subfield. And so they were the first people to observe that when you tropicalize, when you you take the image of the valuation of an F of a variety in this sense, you end up with the support of a polyhedral complex. So you end up with something with this com this combinatorial structure. Okay. So that, so that's the first part of the proof of, of the statement rather. And then the connectedness was observed first by this is Bogut, Jensen, Speyer, Sturmfels, and Thomas, 
who first made the observation, and then this was corrected and expanded on by Cartwright and Payne. So there's BJSST, Bogart, Jensen, Schweier, Stimfels, and Thomas, and Cartwright, Payne are, are this fact about connected through code dimension one, which I'll come back to. Okay, so that's the goal. So now let me back off and sort of introduce some of the words. And to make it as accessible as possible, I would, don't want to assume that you know any of them. So please do continue to ask questions if anything is unclear. Okay, let's start with polyhedral complex because I said it, tropical variety is the support of a polyhedral complex. So we'll start with a polyhedron is the intersection of finitely many half spaces in R to the N. So if I start with a, if I just have a hyperplane in Rn, you know, the set of x for which a dot x equals b, that divides R to the N into two pieces, which you can think of, so two half spaces, I think it was the positive part and the negative part, which you've chosen a sign for the normal vector. And then the polyhedron is just going to be the intersection of finitely many of these. So we could write this as the set of x for which a times x is less than or equal to b, where a is a d by n matrix and b is an r to the d. So that's if we're going to intersect d half spaces in r to the n. But that means you, you're going to get what are examples of polyhedra. Well, all the polygons, three-dimensional polytopes that you know, like the cube, the tetrahedron, icosahedron, etc. So I've got a cube here. There. And then also things that they might be unbounded as well, though. So it doesn't have to be a, a bounded object. So here in this picture, you're meant to imagine this going off to infinity off to the, the right here. So and this is going to be the intersection of three half spaces. X is greater than or equal to zero. Y is greater than or equal to zero. And then something like X plus Y is greater than or equal to one. Okay. In the same way, the cube you can see is an intersection of six half spaces. Okay. And we'll say that my polyhedron P is R rational if A is a rational matrix. Okay. So, right. so question, do we need it to be bounded? No. We do not need our, our polyhedra to be bounded. And in, in this case, it's meant to be an example where it's not bounded. So we're going to say P is R rational if A is a rational matrix. So that's saying we want the half spaces, these hyperplanes, means you want the normal vectors to have rational entries, but the B, the right-hand side, does not need to be rational. So often we talk about rational polytopes or rational polyhedra, where we want both the, the matrix A and the right-hand side vector B to be rational. But for in the tropical context, we're happy with R rational, so we just want the normal vectors to be rational. Okay. Now, a face of a polyhedron is the intersection of your polyhedron with a supporting hyperplane. So a supporting hyperplane is a hyperplane H where P is in of is completely contained in one half space. So maybe I've just arbitrarily chosen H plus here. Okay, so for example, if I take this polyhedron from the previous slide and I take this, which we were saying is maybe X equals zero, this hyperplane, you can see it's supporting because all of the polytope is on this side. All of the polyhedron rather is on this side. And so the, the bit of solid red is going to be a face of the polyhedron. Okay. Similarly, if I take this half space, so this hyperplane, it's supporting because the, you know? the, the polyhedron is completely on this side. And then the intersection is just this vertex here. Okay. So you can see that we're going to get vertices like this. We'll also get edges. You'd get, if I had a three-dimensional polyhedron, you'd get what we normally think of as faces colloquially, like faces of a cube. And then uh, uh, in the version of the definition I've given, as is asked as a question, yes, the, I will regard the empty set as, a, as a, a face from this context. There's a bit of ambiguity, depends on your, normally depends on your applications, whether you want the empty set to be a face, or sometimes you want the whole polyhedron to be a face, which as I've, I think as I've technically done, and we're not quite allowing. Hmm. Okay, so let's just do a reality check. So same algorithm as last time. I will now pause until enough people have typed in the chat and answer to how many faces 
does a square have? So just to check that we're happy with what I mean by faces of a polyhedron. So, ooh, we're not converging yet. <laughs> okay, so what, some people are hedging their, their bets. Okay, so I think, I, I think we are almost converging. In, I think I would, I would agree with the answer nine for the definition I've given, because we're going to have four vertices, four edges, and then the empty face is in the way that I've given the definition, right? And then you might want to, then someone saying eight to 10, and I can see really hedging your bets, but I would sort of agree with that because it depends on whether you want the empty set or the whole, or the whole square to be a face. Okay, great. Right. So, so that's faces. Why do we care about faces? Because what we really care about is polyhedral complexes. And a polyhedral complex is going to be a collection of polyhedra. The intersection of any two is a face of each. Okay, And that's why I wanted the empty set to be a face, so that I can say things like, if I have this one, which is a polyhedral complex, the intersection of this tri triangular cone with the square is empty. So it's still true that the intersection is a face of each. Okay, so that you can see here, I've got a collection of polyhedra and the intersection of any two, they're intersecting along vertices or edges. So they're all faces. Okay. On the other hand, this thing on the right is not a polyhedral complex because if I look at this face here, this polyhedron and this polyhedron, they don't intersect along a face because here, if I look at the intersection, it's just going to be this ray which is a face of, of this polyhedron, but it's not a face of this. This, is, this ray is contained in this face here, but it's, it's not there. Question asking whether a polyhedral complex has to be connected, no, because if you remember, I allowed the empty set to be a, as, a, as a face of both polyhedra. So the, you could have two disconnected pieces there. And what is the line on the right of the bottom? Of the, so the idea here is, as, as I've defined it, though we'll come back to this, I don't need my all the polyhedra to be the same dimension. So the idea is that in this picture, you've got a square, you've got these codes, and now you've just got this ray coming out here. And that's perfectly good because the intersection of this and this is still this vertex, which is the face here. Okay, so that's polyhedral complex. A polyhedral complex is just a union of polyhedra that intersect nicely. What about the support? The support is just the union of those polyhedra as a subset of R to the N. And so here I've got two polyhedral complexes on the, the left and on the right. These are actually, they're meant to be unbounded. And so you're meant to think of them as the special case of polyhedral complexes called fans, which is when we, all the polyhedra are just cones. They're, they're just, they're unbounded with one vertex. And then the support is shown in the middle. It's just the subset of Rn that lives in any of the cones. Okay. And one thing you'll notice is that I've got two different polyhedral complexes. So this one has these four cones. This one has three cones with the same support. So this is why, so in tropical geometry, we often have the, there is a polyhedral complex related to our tropicalization, but there's not a canonical one which is why we'll talk about the support of a polyhedral complex. A okay. polyhedral complex is pure if every maximal dimensional polyhedron has the same dimension. Okay. So we saw, so these two are both pure because that every maximal polyhedron here is two dimensional. So these are two dimension, no polyhedral complexes. But on the previous slide where we had the, the question, oops, wrong way. Here, in this polyhedral complex, this is not pure because I have some two-dimensional polyhedra, but then this weird ray is also a maximal polyhedra. So maximal means with respect to containment. So maximal meaning there's no bigger polyhedron in which your, your polyhedron is contained. So this is one-dimensional, this is two, so it's not pure. Okay. So support, union of polyhedra, pure means every maximal thing has the same dimension. 
and then it's r rational if every polyhedron in the complex is r rational so that's saying that our normal vectors are all rational vectors so the normal vectors to to these supporting hyperplanes or, or normal vectors to the hyperplanes defining the half spaces that we're intersecting okay so that's our first definition. So, so far that means we've gone through and we've understood half of the words in, in this theorem. Mm, so, right, so question, uh, okay, so two more questions. Okay, so let me come back and there. So again, R rational meant for polyhedra, meant for polyhedra, R ra is rational if A is a rational matrix. Mm, and by dimension, we mean, what do we mean by the dimension of a polyhedral complex? So the dimension of a polyhedron, you can sort of look locally. One way you can do is to, well, it is to take the affine span. So just take the smallest affine hyperplane or the F, take the smallest affine subspace that contains your polyhedron. And, and it's the dimension of that subspace. So here we would say these are two dimensional. This one is one dimensional because the there's a one dimensional affine subspace containing it. Okay. And here we're in, so question say we're, in, we're, in, we're thinking about polyhedral complexes in R to the N. Okay. Someone's saying why R instead of Q? I mean, you can talk about, so it depends on what your applications are, right? I think most people who want to think about polyhedra are going to start in R to the N because it's the, it's somehow the natural world to live in it for the from a tropical point of view what matters to us most is the image of our valuation so we need to live so if your valuation and if the if the value group of your valuation so the image of your valuation is contained in the rationals then q to the n would be okay but other what but here we go to what are and so the maximal, right, so, you, so is the question why is, um, so if the question was why is this one here not pure, because the maximal dimensional, it pure meant every maximal dimension in, has the same dimension. So it's pure if every maximal dimensional, sorry, every, I should say every maximal, ah, okay, sorry, yes, I've re the, you're, there's a typo on the slide, I don't understand, sorry, if every maximal polyhedron has the same dimension, so we should kill the dimensional from, from this word. Yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, so just to, to restate, it's pure if every maximal with respect to inclusion polyhedron has, has the same dimension. Okay, okay, so we have, I think at this point, subject to that typo, we have have, we've now understood half the words in this theorem. Okay, we know what it means to be the support of a pure R rational balanced polyhedral. So, sorry, we know what it means to be the support of a pure R rational polyhedral complex of dimension the dimension of X. Okay, so that leaves me with two more bits to understand. We have to understand balanced and connected through codimension one. So let's do that now, but maybe I should pause for, yeah, maybe I should pause for, for any other questions at this point. Okay, so let's come back to connected. I'll start with connected through co-dimension one. This turns out to be the hardest to prove, but actually the fairly easy to understand. So a pure polyhedral complex is connected through codimension one. If I can walk from any poly maximal polyhedra in the complex to any other maximal polyhedra, passing through mm, in a path where I, I, I jump from one polyhedra to another, uh, only crossing faces of codimension one. Okay, so the idea is this is connected through codimension one because suppose I wanted to go from this face to this face, then I can walk. I can cross, this is a one dimensional polyhedral complex. So co-dimension one means zero dimensional, means vertices. I can go from here, cross the vertex to 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 here, and then to here. Okay, so, and you can check if, if you choose any other pair of faces, any maximal polyhedra here, 
you can pass from one to the other. So in this case, when it's one dimensional connected through cone dimension one is the same as connected. In higher dimensions, it's not though. So here we have a two dimensional pure polyhedral complex that is not connected through cone dimension one because I can't go from this top polyhedron to any other ones because there's no path, there's no way to get from this polyhedron to this polyhedron via a path that only shares faces of co-dimension one. Okay, since co-dimension one would mean edges and this only, while it's co connected, it only intersects the rest of the complex in the zero dimensional vertex. So this one is connected through co-dimension one, this one is not. It's fairly straightforward to explain, surprisingly difficult to prove. So somehow this is one of the deeper parts of the story I'm telling you about this week. Essentially every other fact I'm telling you, you can, there is a proof that's accessible to a sufficiently motivated finishing undergraduate. Might not be easy, might be a bit involved or subtle, but at least it's not using incredibly technical algebraic geometry. It's only a, a fairly small jump from your first algebra class. This though, the connectedness result, I don't know. I don't know a more elementary proof. So it somehow uses deeper mathematics. Okay, so again, maximal dimensional, again, is meaning I look at, so it should be, um, so, oh, so, so because it's pure, right, here, here we don't have my problem because it's pure, so maximal dimensional and maximal will be the same. So the maximal dimensional here, every maximal polyhedron is one dimensional. On the right, every maximal dimensional, every maximal polyhedra is two dimensional. And these are the same as maximal dimensional. Okay, so that's connected through co-dimension one. And what you, I mean, you, you should just take away to first approximation, it's sort of connected plus. We're saying it's connected in a particularly nice fashion. Okay, so that's that. Do, do all the PI, and, and, yeah, and yes, all the PI and the path should have, have maximal dimension. That, that, yes, that is the idea. Sorry, I should, yes, I should, should have said that. Okay, let's do the balancing condition though. This is somehow the most important definition that we're going to do today. So it's the, sort of the key idea. And this is as follows. I'm going to give you the definition first for one dimensional weighted rational polyhedral fans. So a weighting means I'm going to put a weight on every maximal polyhedron. So in this case, it's going to be a cone. It's a one dimensional rational polyhedral fan. Fan means they're all cones. So I only have one vertex and these are all unbounded. So it's just a union of rays. And I want it to be rational. That means that there is every ray is going to contain a lattice point, a point in Z to the N. And I'm going to choose UI to be the first lattice point, first meaning counting from the origin. And so the first point in Z to the N. Okay, so I've drawn this picture, I've labeled the first, so this is the span, the, the, the ray spanned by one zero, and you can check one zero is the first lattice point there, the ray spanned by zero one, minus five one, and minus two three. And then the numbers in red are my multiplicities. These are these MIs, the weights I'm putting there. The balancing condition now says it's balanced if this weighted sum MI UI is zero. Okay, so one way to think about that is we, I'm going to um, put down a stake at the origin here. I'm going to stand four people at one zero zero one minus five one and minus two, three. And then I'm going to say, okay, you pull with, with strength seven, you pull with strength two, you two pull with strength one, and then nothing is going to happen, okay? The, the center of my rope is not going to move. So this is a zero tension condition in the sense of engineering, okay? The sum of the MI UI is zero is saying, if we do a play a tug of war game, no one is going to win. Okay, let's check. The calculation we're doing here to check that no one wins is that the sum of the MI UI is zero. So for this example, that is seven times one zero 
plus 2 times 0, 1, plus 1 times minus 2 minus 3, plus 1 times minus 5, 1. And you can check that if I, as long as I didn't make an arithmetic error, this should add up to 0, 0. Okay, Poly question was polyhedral fan is a polyhedral complex where every polyhedron is a cone. So a cone means a polyhedron AX less than or equal to zero. So it's just mm, positive combinations of a bunch of rays. So in this case, it's just the positive combination there. Mm. And question of, I think, I think this could question about inscribed polygons is, is a question I'm going to leave for you to, to look at the problem sheet for tomorrow. Because I think you're asking, how, can't we just prove in, in the plane, there is a way to, you, you're probably asked looking for the proof in the plane. And this definition is not, so my normal vector, er, so I'm forgetting the normal vector and my UI has to be the first lattice point on, on the ray. So this is this condition about the GCDs being one is saying I'm not allowed to scale the UIs. You, your normal vector might have been scaled, but the, U, but the UI you don't have any choice on. Okay, let's do a reality check because this is an important definition. Same thing. What value of A makes this fan balanced? This will probably require a bit more thought, so we'll maybe pause for a little longer. Uh, so. Okay, so we're asking the sum of MI, UI should add up to zero. Okay, and this time there is a lot more agreement. Everyone seems to think and agree with me this time, luckily, that, that the sum should be five. Okay, great. So we're looking to just, we're just adding up the red number times the, the first lattice point and making sure it's zero. Okay, so that's the balancing condition for one dimensional fans. Zero, dimension, zero tension condition and no one wins the tug of war game. I'm not going to write, what, where, so why does the, the fan have a bound on the end? Should it reach to infinity? Um, oh, so this is just my picture. I mean, if, if, if the question is, should this line go all the way and head off the, the screen? Absolutely, yes. It, so it's, it's going all the way up there, it's going up there. I completely agree. Okay, what about higher dimensions? I'm not going to quite give you the definition here. So, but I'll give you an idea. And so we say in higher dimensions, we look, it's going to be balanced if we look around every co-dimension one polyhedron. So in this picture, my co-dimension one polyhedra are the vertices. And then I look at the star around this. So rather than giving you a formal definition, let me tell you, Give you the idea of what the star is. The star means look locally ar around this, this vertex and if you just look locally you'll see something that looks like our standard tropical line. So you look at what you see locally and imagine it's spreading out to infinity as a fan. Okay so there and if I have weights on all of the these maximal polyhedra so in this case I haven't actually drawn the weights because I could take them all to be one my local picture, what I see if I just look super locally, I could inherit the weights, the lo the weights locally. And then in this case, you say, hey, this looks like a one-dimensional fan if I just look around here, and it's my standard tropical line, so I know I can check that that's balanced. If I look at this vertex and I look locally, I'll get something that looks like a backwards tropical line. Okay, and so you can check there. I'd be saying. 1 times 1, 1 times plus 1 times minus 1, 0 plus 1 times 0, minus 1. And you can check that that adds up to 0, 0. So it's balanced there. And now in this picture, if you keep on looking at every vertex, you'll notice that every pic around every vertex, locally, it's either a standard tropical line or it's a backwards tropical line. So that says, according to this definition, it's, go it's going to be balanced. Question was, is the choice of weights unique? There's several ways I could, I'm gonna actually postpone that question one more moment because there's two ways 
is that question could mean and, and we'll, we'll sort of come back to it. Just want to say a few more words about what would I do if instead of a one-dimensional polyhedral complex, I drawn something two-dimensional? If well, or let's suppose I drawn something five-dimensional. Okay. Then the co-dimension one would be four dimensions. So if I looked locally around a four-dimensional thing, what I would see would look like a one-dimensional fan cross R to the four. And I want to, that R to the four is called the linearity space. I want a quotient by it. And then I just go to the definition on the previous slide because I'm left with a one-dimensional fan. And so the condition, the balancing condition is when I do this locally at every co-dimension one face, I should get it's something that, in, that once I've turned it into the one dimensional fan problem, it should satisfy this balancing from the previous slide. Okay, is the choice of weights unique? So, here in this case, it actually is. There's only up to scaling, there is only one way to make this balanced. So, this picture, I, I could put all the weights all one, or I could put the weights all two or all three. And these, but once I choose what a weight is here, it turns out in this case, the rest of the weights are determined. And we call this tropically irreducible. In general, though, this comes back to the question we had earlier about the, the difference between the variety of an ideal or the variety of the radical. As a set, just like in classical algebraic geometry, we don't see the difference. In usual algebraic geometry, if we want to, to know the difference between an ideal and its radical, we have to pass to schemes. Or there was actually something before schemes, we, so old, slightly older than schemes, you might look at the cycle of the ideal. So that's remembering some multiplicity information. If you have a, a point, it's remembering just a weight on the point instead of remembering the exact scheme structure at the point. And in tropical geometry, when I remember the weights, I'm remembering some cycle information. So for example, if instead of my equation for my elliptic curve, if I squared it, I would get the same set, but I double the weights. And that would, would change that. Why am I saying I would double the weights? That's because what I'm about to tell you about that the weights there are if I, if you start with a variety there are there is a choice of weights that's associated to it okay question should should the weights be integers if we start with a variety as i'll, I'll explain there are natural positive integers that we're going to associate that, that will take as weights in general you could ask the question just what are the possible weights that make something balanced and, then, and that's a question that sort of turns into, for those who know what it, toric geometry, that turns into a question about a, a child group of a toric variety. Um, someone said, looking at the normal vectors of those four dimensional fans in 5R. So this is when I had the example of a, I was thinking of a, four, a five dimensional polyhedral complex maybe embedded in 10 space. And I look at the four dimensional face and then the normal vectors are, yes, so exactly, the one dimensional, I see, the one dimensional fan you're seeing is exactly the normal, it's the normal vectors to the, to the four dimensional face of your five dimensional polyhedra, exactly. And yeah, so, and exactly, the, the idea is, balancing is defined by looking locally around co-dimension one and quotienting down so that you get a one dimensional example as in, in the slide that we saw here. Okay, let's just look at the structure theorem again. Now we know if I start with an irreducible subvariety of affine space, then we're saying trop X is the support of a pure R rational balanced polyhedral complex of dimension dim X that is connected through co dimension one. Okay. Now we know how to we say, now we know the meanings of all these words. The one piece I, we haven't covered is how is it balanced, which means I'm claiming, and I will tell you in a moment, that the variety X gives you a choice of weights on the polyhedral complex that you choose that makes it balanced. Question, does the theorem go both ways? 
No. Okay. This is an interesting question. This is the sort of the realizability question in tropical geometry. And there's still, we know a lot about this question, but there's also an awful lot we don't know. And there's a lot of open research questions. But in particular, one easy way, we may hear later, but one easy way to know that it, it doesn't go both ways is to use the theory of matroids from combinatorics, combinatorial optimization. And we'll hear more about that later in this lecture series. Yeah. There. Okay, and so another question, if we're talking about the variety, why is there a weight? So this is maybe, technically we should think of it as a tropical cycle. It's maybe instead of a tropical variety. So once I put the weights on, then I'm thinking about it as a cycle. Okay, other questions? Okay, so let me tell you about where do the weights come from? So this is this is the multiplicities. And we're going to just focus on the, we're going to just focus on the case of the trivial valuation case. Okay, so I see a few more. So a tropical cycle is the set with the weights. So remember, it's, the, it's remembering the weights. And the polyhedral complex will be contained in a vector space. If we're starting with an F, a subvariety of, of an, it will be contained in r to the n or r bar to the n. Okay, then the question, how many elliptic curves have the same tropicalization? An infinite number. Okay, because we can think about that. You have all you're remembering is the valuation of the coefficients. If you've got, if your elliptic curve was a, you was defined, was embedded in the plane as, as the solutions to a cubic, the only thing that we're remembering is the valuations of the, those coefficients. Okay, so let's come back to multiplicities. E, so we have here, so I'm going to only tell you about it in the trivial valuation case. If you'd like to know the non-trivial valuation case, you should go to the problem session tomorrow or, well, or look at the problem sheet. So, and this is going to be, I'm going to phrase it algebraically as an initial ideal. Geometrically, what we're doing is we're taking the limit of a one-parameter torus section. Okay, so let's start with a W. I'm going to restrict just to R to the N, and we'll have a polynomial, the sum of AU X to the U. Then the initial term of F is, it's going to be a polynomial, and it's going to be the sum of those AU X to the U for which W dot U is minimal. If you've seen Grobner bases and, and initial, initial ideals with respect to weight vectors before, the one difference here is that we've got minimal, whereas in usual Grobner bases we take maximal. Okay, this is chosen to make it more consistent with the, the valuations. Okay, so we're just taking the, the sum of those terms where w dot u is minimal. If we work over a non-trivial valuation, then it's more complicated. We have to go. Ooh, this polynomial would not live in the original field, have coefficients in the original field, but in a residue field. But we'll, we'll leave that for the problem session. Let's look at an example. Then if I, if I start with a polynomial, one minus x squared minus y to the seventh plus x cubed y to the fifth, and I set w to be one zero, then I claim that the initial term with respect to one zero is going to be one minus y to the seventh. Okay, so I have to ask myself the weights. So the weight, this weight w dot u, so w is one zero, u here would be zero zero, two zero, zero seven, and three comma five. So my weights are going to be zero, two, zero, and three. So the minimum is zero, and that's achieved at one and minus x y to the seventh. And so the initial term is one minus y to the seventh. Okay, another one, let's do another example on this one. If I take minus two minus three, then in the game, we have to think about the weights. The weights are going to be zero, minus four, minus 21, then minus six, minus 15 is also minus 21. 
So the minimum of w dot u is minus 21. And that's going to be achieved. At, so we've got minus y to the seventh plus x cubed y to the fifth. Okay, so those are two examples of the initial terms. And then if we have an ideal in my polynomial ring, I can form the initial ideal. And that's just going to be the ideal generated by the initial terms. And I want to do, I'm sort of combining two definitions here in the slide for this presentation. I want to move it from affine space to the torus geometrically. And that means instead of looking at the usual polynomial ring, I want to regard this as an ideal in the Laurent polynomial ring. So I'm, my variables are allowed, my variables x1 to xn are now invertible. So geometrically, that means we're looking at varieties in the torus, the algebraic torus, which is affine space with all the, the, the zero coordinates removed instead of in just affine space. Okay. So geometrically, again, if I look past from the variety of f to the variety of the initial ideal, what am I doing? I'm taking a one parameter torus. So I've, the, the t to the w's would give me, well, if, if w is a integer vector, will give me a one parameter torus and I'm taking the limit of that action on my variety. Okay, but let's stay with the algebra and do a, oops, I think I want a reality check here. So the reality check is what is in zero one of f for this polynomial f? So again, we'll take a, a moment and write. And someone's asking, is there a relationship between the genus of a variety and its tropicalization? And the answer there is yes. So we've seen some relation between the, um, you, you've seen in the tropical, on the elliptic curves, we've had a cycle. And that's where we're remembering some of them. But it's not a perfect relationship. And we seem to have converged on one minus x squared exactly. Good. So again, because here we're saying what the, the minimum weight is again zero, and the one one and x squared have weight zero. Okay. So that's the the initial forms. What about the multiplicity? So here's the second important definition. And this is a little hard the first time you see it, but it's somehow geometrically. So I'm going to try to give you the geom a geometric answer. So at the top here, we just have the reminder of our definition of the initial forms. So now, remember, we're looking to get a weighting on my polyhedral complex. That means I want to put weights on the maximal polyhedra. So I'm going to take a W that's in the relative interior. That just means, relative interior just means take the interior, or if you would, so, so take what you would see as the interior if you, if, if you took the span. So... If, if you've got a, I guess, a square in three space, anything in the, in, inside the square. Okay, so it turns out that if you do that, the initial, the variety of the initial ideal is going to be a union of translates of the, of the correct dimensional subtori of k star to the n. So k star here means k take away zero. So this is the algebraic torus. So k star to the n is the algebraic torus. And it turns out the variety is a union of translates. It's easier to see this in an example rather than me try to say more about this. But then we're going to have a union of translates of these subtori, and the multiplicity is going to be the number of these subtori counted with multiplicity. Okay, that sounds a little recursive, but I promise you it's not. The second multiplicity just means the same multiplicity. I mean, you're happy that if I say, if I talk about a cubic polynomial in one variable and, and say that it has three roots counted with multiplicity. So it's, it's that same sort of idea that you, you, might, you might get a doubled subtore or, or something. Let's see this on an example. If I have the example of the previous slide, one minus x squared minus y to the seventh plus x cubed y to the fifth, then Oh, sorry, question, what is dim i? That means the cruel dimension of the ideal, or equivalently, the dimension of the variety of i. So when we've had our examples, they've been curves. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. I, yeah, it should be dimension of r mod i. Yes, sorry. You. Okay, the, so here we have one minus x squared minus y to the seventh plus x cubed y to the fifth. And I'll take the initial ideal now, 
if you know some Grobner theory, you'll, you'll know that one has to be careful when passing to initial ideals. You can't always just take the initial terms of generators, but for principal ideals, you can. So the initial term with respect to zero one is the exercise you just did. You, we all agreed, think that we got one minus x squared. So we've got the ideal generated by one minus x squared. So the variety, we're now looking at the variety in the torus C star squared of the polynomial one minus x squared. Okay. Well, that's easy. That x is, is plus or minus one. So my variety is one is the union of one comma a, where a is in C star, or minus one comma a, where a is in C star. And you'll notice this is just a one dimension, this is just a subtorus. Okay, it's a subgroup. You know, the, the torus is, is a group and this is a subgroup. And, and then the and this is a subtorus because it's just a it's just a, a copy of C star, which is a one-dimensional subtorus. And then here this is a translate because it's just a translate by minus one. Okay, and we have two, so I'm going to the multiplicity is two. Okay, how do we see in general that this is a union of subtori? It's not hard, hard, but maybe it's a bit more than, than one sentence. I mean, you have to make an argument that you know that this variety is, so you, you argue that this variety has the right dimension, that's not hard, that's standard Grobner theory, and is homogeneous under, a, has an action of the, of the torus of the right dimension, so therefore has to be, has to be a union of subtori. Do we always get binomials with the appropriate course of W? Almost, not quite, but almost. We so if the multiplicity is one, then we almost then then we always will because then we'll actually have what's called a toric ideal. In general, though, you have a union of of these components. So each component is going to be a subtorus, a translate of a subtori. E that will be cut out by binomials. So each component of of this initial ideal will be binomials. But the the ideal of the union might not be. Okay, let's do another example. So this is just the same polynomial, another example. If I now take minus two minus three, we saw last time on the previous slide that the initial term was minus y to the seventh plus x cubed y to the fifth. So the initial term, because we're, and this is why we now work in the torus. So because we're working the Laurent polynomial ring, so y is now invertible, the ideal generated by minus y to the seventh plus x cubed y to the fifth is the same as the ideal generated by minus y squared plus x cubed. So the variety is just, I can just parameterize it. Again, it's rational. It's, we've just got a squared, a cubed, where a is in C star. And so that says this is one copy of the torus. It's just one subtorus. And so the multiplicity is one. So the fact that we're getting a one here is because we've only got one subtorus here. Whereas in the previous example, here we had two unions and we're getting, in, we had two subtori, so we're getting multiplicity two. And, oh, yes, sorry, that is a, a, a second typo, thank you. Right, so this, this should be a minus two minus three, because it's meant to be the same there. Okay, thank you. Okay, other comments, questions? Okay, so again, what are we saying? We're saying that the multiplicities, I start with a variety, the multiplicities I'm going to associate to it are these ones coming from, we, we take a W in the maximal polyhedra, we pass to the initial ideal geometrically, we, we, we push, we take the, the limit of, of this one parameter torus action and of this one parameter torus, and then we, we end up with a union of subtori and we count how many we have counted with multiplicity. And that gives us a weighting on the fan and the claim is that it's balanced with respect to that weighting. So maybe that's a question for after the main part of the talk about an example with a subtorus of multiplicity two. How do I know that these have multiplicity one? Because this is, a, in this case, because it's a prime ideal. If I'd had the square of this ideal, I would have got multiplicity two. Okay, so we're counting, this is multiplicity e, 
of, I guess, of associated primes. So there. Yeah. And the multiplicity is the same for all W in one, or maybe you could choose a, a polyhedral complex structure so that the multiplicity is the same for all W in one maximal polyhedra. Okay, so let's just state the theorem again. We have an irreducible subvariety of affine space. Then trop X is the support of a pure R rational balanced polyhedral complex, balanced with these multiplicities that we just talked about, of dimension the dimension of X that is connected through co-dimension one. And so that's the structure theorem. We're saying when we take this combinatorial shadow of my variety by taking the image under the valuation, I get this thing with a lot of structure. Okay. Just want to finish by saying a few words about two other topics very briefly. The first is how do we actually compute tropical varieties? If I want to do an example, well, you've seen already those, particularly those of you who came to the problem sessions, that even doing a, an example by hand can be a bit tricky. There's the main software program to compute tropical varieties is called GFAN, G stands for Grobner Fan, and by Anna's Jensen. So this works by doing a Grob, what's called a Grobner walk on the tropical variety. That means it first finds one of the polyhedra, and then it walks, it uses the fact that it, we know it's connected through co-dimension one, and it walks along in the, the tropical variety. So we might start with one, we go to this vertex, we discover two and three, from three, we discover its other vertex, and we, dis we discover four and five. We go to this vertex, we discover six and seven. From five, we go to this vertex, and we discover eight and nine. So this way, you can kind of do a, a walk, spread out, and discover all of the tropical variety. And this is, so it's implemented in Anna's GFAN. And then there are interfaces to GFAN in other computer algebra systems, in particular singular, with tropical.lib, this is perhaps more developed, and also Macaulay too, so I'm, I'm involved in, in this interface, which is maybe not quite yet as, as developed. And then we also want to advertise Polymake also has good tropical functionality, and the thing which when you're first starting out is good to know is that it has some functionality for visualizing hypersurfaces in two and three dimensions. So with a few commands, if you, if you have Polymake installed, you can type not that many commands and see the pictures that some of you have been struggling to draw. Um, and the, and the, the sort of pictures that we've been seeing here. So it will, it will draw these pictures for you if your hypersurface is two or three dimensions. And then the last point is how else, what's the trick to draw them? So this is more sort of a line for people who've come to the problem sessions, so have, have worked hard to try and draw these. Yes. I claim if I start with a curve in the plane, the tropicalization of X equals the, it's the rays of the norm, inner normal fan of the Newton polytope of F. Okay. Rather than defining all of those words for you, I'm going to tell you what they are in an example. The Newton polytope, I just take the exponents that show up in, in my polynomial and I take their convex hull. So that means draw, all lines connecting them and all lines connecting the points you've added, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, if I start with X plus Y minus one, I would just get the triangle here. So this is a filled in triangle. And then the inner normal fan, remember my triangle, it's a polyhedron, it's an intersection of half spaces. I take the half spaces that actually matter, or that are necessary to define it. I take their normal vectors and I, I choose the normal vectors so that they point into the, the, the polyhedron. And then if you draw that, you can see in this case, I've drawn my inner normal vectors and I've got exactly the picture that I've seen before. Okay, so for more details, and in particular the non-trivial valuation case, you should look, come to the problem session tomorrow or look at the problem sheet. So there'll, there'll be more on that. It, and maybe we've got questions of, so Newton poly, so this example, the Newton polytope, again, was I look at the monomials that show up. So in this case, they're X, Y, and one. I can write this as, in my multi-index notation, this is X to the one zero. So I write one zero here. This would be X to the zero one. If I so this is if I was thinking instead of X and Y, I had X one and Y one, and X two. 
So the y corresponds to 0, 1, and then this would be x to the 0, 0. So I write 0, 0 here, and then I take the convex hull. Okay, and this, so this generalizes to higher dimensions for hypersurfaces. So hypersurfaces, you do the same thing. You take the co-dimension one faces of the normal fan to the Newton polytope. Okay. And then okay, another question was, is, are there, is there a connection between toric varieties and tropicalizations? Absolutely. There's a very, very, very deep connection be between these, these two stories. And, and there's a lot of there. So how do we... So in the trivial valuation case, the rays always do go through the origin, yes. So, yeah. so maybe the question of how do we know this works, I think that's a question for look at, at the problem sheet for tomorrow. So maybe let me finish the formal part of the, of the talk bit with a shameless plug, which is everything I've talked about this week is, is a subset of my book with Birch Dernfels, Introduction to Tropical Geometry, which is published by the AMS. So more detail there, but I also have a few survey papers I think there's one called Introduction to Tropical Algebraic Geometry, which you can find also in the archive.